The Longevity Project actually started in 1921 when Lewis Terman at Stanford uh, recruited over 1,500 kids, boys and girls, to be part of this study. He planned to follow them into early adulthood to see if they grew up to be well-adjusted, you know, thriving people. He actually ended up studying them until he died. And we picked up the study about 20 years ago and have been trying to see who lives long and who dies young, why some people stay healthy and why some people become ill. We've published a lot of papers and people always ask us questions about other studies. We'll start talking about one and they say, well, what about this, what about that? And we decided that this was a really good time to put together all of the findings in one spot, in one book, so that people who are interested generally about all the different things that lead to long life and health could find them in one place. There's a huge myth that's out there, which is that if you want to live a long life, you need a long checklist of do's and don'ts, the, all the right foods to eat, all the foods that you should never eat, all of the exercises that you need to do, even if you hate them. And the Longevity Project is really a myth buster. What we discovered is that you don't need a long checklist in order to live a long life. It's really a lot simpler than that. There were many surprising and intriguing findings in the Longevity Project. One of those that amazed me the most was that hard work, and even stressful hard work, was not harmful. Actually, the people who work the hardest live the longest. What we found, and this is true in other shorter term studies as well, is that cheerfulness and optimism really is a good thing, particularly if you're facing a short term crisis. You know, it sort of keeps you motivated. If you expect that things will turn out okay, you may be more likely to hang in there with a treatment or, or some sort of a process that will get you back on your feet. But as a life approach, the, the children who were more cheerful and optimistic and kind of happy-go-lucky, they tended to take a lot more risks with their health. They had an attitude that was sort of, everything will turn out all right, and, and that tended to make them a bit more careless, which wasn't good in terms of their longevity. Probably the most surprising thing to me in the Longevity Project was the differences that we found for men versus women when they encountered divorce. Divorce certainly is stressful and a bad thing for anyone, but men were really able to improve their odds and ameliorate their risks by getting remarried after a divorce. That wasn't really so much the case for women. Women were just about as well off if they stayed single following a divorce. Of course, exercise in the, in the form of physical activity is, is predictive of long life and does help to keep you healthy, but not the kind of exercise that most people usually worry about and obsess about. It wasn't necessary to go to the gym the same time every day and do the same certain number of, of activities, keep track of how many steps you've taken each day. The people who lived the longest, they didn't worry about things like that. They just lived a naturally active life, and that, that was sufficient. Many of the parents in this study were smart parents, and they had smart children in the study, and they thought, well, let's, let's give them an advantage by putting them in school really early, but we found that Starting first grade, a structured environment, too early, at too early an age, was really harmful. It led to problems in adolescence for the children, and it led to problems later in life, and in fact, they died at a younger age. The Longevity Project doesn't burden you with endless lists of things you do to lead a long and healthy life. In fact, it shows that certain simple, straightforward patterns can be developed, that anybody can develop, and once you get on the right pattern, you are more, much more likely to live a long and healthy life.